Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. My name is Tony Fox. I'm a professor at the College of Maritime Operational Warfare, and I am today standing in for my colleague and boss, uh, Professor Dave Pilati, who unfortunately could not make it today. But I'm happy to be able to do this because it gives me the chance to introduce to you Dr. Sally Payne. When I showed her before we began the copy of the biography I had begun to write about her to introduce her to you, she said, this is way over the top. Well, if it is, it's only because she has done many of the things that I wished I could do when I was a college student. So let me begin. Dr. Sally Payne began teaching in the Strategy and Policy Department here at the War College in 2000. Since that time, she has been regularly honored for her many achievements here, being named the Sims Professor of History and Grand Strategy in 2014, and then two years ago, appointed a university professor. This is an extremely rare honor. The Naval War College's most distinguished professional title for a faculty member, and just one of many of the awards that she has received over her career. After graduating from Harvard College with high honors, Sally went on to obtain a PhD in history from Columbia University. Over the years, she has studied and done research in such places as Japan, China, Russia, and Australia. And she has published many, many books. Her academic focus has been on relations among China, Russia, and Japan, and on the operational and strategic effects of naval operations to include blockades, raiding, and perhaps most importantly in some ways, the non-combat uses of navies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sally Payne. was over the top. I paid him. Anyway, it is my great pleasure. Let's see if to change the slide. Yeah. It is my great pleasure to be with you. I'm Sally Payne, the Strategy and Policy Department. And I will give you the promised lecture on uh, what happened to the good old Soviet uh, good old Soviet Union in the end of the day, et cetera, but I have another plan as well, it's two purpose. For those of you who aren't students here, is to give you a window onto the curriculum here. And this is an old lecture that used to be um, part of the senior level course. Uh, it got changed out because we mix and match lectures every year. And what this one is all about is counter arguments. We ask students to answer questions and then one of the most difficult things to do is to counter the argument of your most persuasive critic. So what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna ask the question. This is the assigned question. Why did the Soviet Union lose the Cold War? I'm not gonna ask you what lose means. You're just gonna accept it. They lost the Cold War. Don't even argue about that part. And then the student who's assigned this lucky question has to come up with an answer. Typical answer might be that Reagan defeated the Russians, right? You've heard that one. It's all about Ronald. He did it. That's a thesis. All right, I'm going to give you a whole, I will lay out that argument, but then I'm going to give you all sorts of counter arguments to it. And a whole bunch of them will be like the first one, which are a bunch of external explanations. What did other countries do to the Soviet Union to bring it down? But then I'll turn to a bunch of internal explanations to say, Wait a minute, where there's some self-defeating things going on within the Soviet Union, where there's some bad things going on. These would be internal domestic explanations. And then I'm going to turn to some overarching explanations. So for those of you who are students who have trouble doing counterarguments, I can't remember how many are in here, like a dozen plus. Okay, so if you believe, very common thesis, that Ronald Reagan won the Cold War, here he is with the Gorbachevs, the Ronald Reagan Ranch after the end of the Cold War, looks really cordial for that kind of explanation. Hmm. What's up? Well, Reagan, as you all know, was a man of words and deeds. He made memorable speeches. Here he is. I think it's actually 1982. That's a typo. Uh, he's addressing parliament and says, look, the regimes planted by totalitarianism have had more than 30 years to take root. 
but none of them have been able to hold elections. Regimes planted by bayonets, they don't acquire legitimacy. And then, who can forget the evil empire speech? And it was delivered in Orlando, Florida, to the National Association of Evangelicals, who gave up a day in Disneyland to hear it. And later, you have Reagan here. He's, giving, he's in Berlin in front of the Brandenburg Gate. It's long a symbol of German greatness, but at this time, it is a closed gate in the Berlin Wall. And what does he have to say? General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate, tear down this wall. Well, here's what Reagan did. He decided he was going to bankrupt them. And there had actually been a military buildup that had begun under President Carter, but Reagan greatly accelerated it and took things to new aggressive levels. First, he funded any anti-Soviet anything, anywhere, all over the world. In addition, he engaged in really aggressive maritime aerial patrolling, reconnaissance missions all over the place. And he enunciated his Reagan doctrine, which is a plan for rolling back uh, the Soviet Union, and the Soviets responded symmetrically. Well, beware of symmetric strategies. They matched us, try to match us dollar for dollar. Here's the problem with that one. If you take the Western Alliance plus Japan, it has the combined GNP seven times that of the Soviet Union. And let's check out the economic burden of all of this. So while we're doing the Reagan buildup, it's about 8% of the US GNP. Germany at that time was around 6%, Japan much less. If you look at Nazi Germany, it's 55%. So that's a really militarized regime. Well, what's the story in the Soviet Union? While the Cold War was going on, the CIA estimated that the Soviet Union was probably spending 20% of its budget on military things. Afterwards, when people started getting the data and could analyze it better, they're going, no, it was at least 40 or 50% of that economy in peacetime that is being spent on all of this military stuff. And then if you include the military industrial complex with all of the infrastructure that is associated with it, the Soviet Union, big country, lots of far-flung facilities, it may have been as much as 70%. So that it would be economy busting if you do this sort of thing. OK, I am going to be quoting many Russians today because they have reflected deeply on what happened to their country, and why not only did the Soviet Union disappear, so you lose the empire, communism disappears, and indeed life as they knew it disappeared. And here you have Valentin Falin. He was a, an ambassador, Soviet ambassador to East Germany, and here's what he had to say. Look, the American strategy of our exhaustion in the arms race put our economy into this major league crisis where we're not being able to spend money on things like health, education, et cetera, et cetera. And then given the fact that there was the Sino-Soviet conflict going on, where Russia's really worried about China and it has to militarize in that direction, the arms race plunged the Soviet economy into a permanent crisis. And here you have Gergi Arbatov. And he was their top expert on this country. And he's looking at Reagan funding anti-Soviet anything all over the world, and particularly in Afghanistan, that really got the government's, Soviet government's attention. He goes, it became quite clear that the Afghan war was most advantageous for the United States, and we got our Vietnam, and we began to realize this. Bad news. And here's Gorbachev speaking to the Politburo a year after he takes office, and he says, Reagan did this strategic defense initiative, his missile shield, and Borgmashov says they're betting, the Americans are betting on precisely the fact that we're going to be afraid of this missile shield. And that's why they're putting all this pressure on us, to exhaust us. Correct. So some would argue that the US victory in the arms race guaranteed victory in the Cold War. That's one way of looking at it. It's all about Ronald Reagan and his arms race, et cetera, and it all worked. But I'm going to give you a whole bunch of other arguments, counter arguments, and I'm going to start with more external explanations, and here's my list. I will start with Ford and Carter, the Helsinki Accords under 
under Ford and the human rights uh, campaign under Carter. So for years and years and years, the Russians really wanted to hold a European-wide conference to confirm their expanded World War II borders. And they were just itching for this. And for years, no one was interested. But by the 1970s, the Western Europeans are just sick of it, and they want to settle out Europe, because they actually have to live there. And we aren't, the United States is not enthusiastic at all. But the conference is held anyway. And we demand that in these Helsinki Accords that are going to be assigned, that they include all sorts of human rights clauses, even though we think the, the accords themselves aren't going to be unimportant, unimportant, and that the Soviets, no way on the planet are they going to adhere to whatever human rights this and that they sign. Well, unbeknownst to us, dissident groups throughout the Eastern Bloc and human rights activists throughout the West started holding the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc allies accountable to the document they signed. And they pointed out the disconnect between the, liberal, the liber, liberation that is promised by communism and the actual dictatorship that was delivered. And these dissident groups in the Eastern Bloc took off and had a life of their own. And here you have Robert Gates, a not too long ago uh, Secretary uh, of Defense, but back in the day, he was the director of the CIA. He has a very distinguished career. And here's his thoughts on it. The Soviets desperately wanted this big European-wide meeting. And it laid the foundations for the end of their empire. We resisted it for years, only to discover much, much later that it had produced benefits that we could never have imagined. Go figure. Turns out that Car Carter's human rights campaign was effective. It resonated most profoundly among Eastern Europeans who were denied precisely the sorts of political rights that he was emphasizing. And here you have a commencement address at Notre Dame in 1977, and here's Carter. We have reaffirmed America's commitment to human rights as a fundamental tenet of our foreign policy. What draws Americans together is a belief in human freedom. We want the world to know that our nation stands for more than just financial prosperity. We're bigger than that. And it's pa Pavel Poloshenko, who was the translator for Gorbachev, he believed that Carter's human rights uh, campaign was profoundly influential in the Soviet Union, where people listened to it and said, you know, we do need to become more de democratic. We need to open up. We need to liberalize. And here you have Eduard Shevardnadze, who was the uh, foreign minister in Russia. He's talking to the Communist Party members of the foreign ministry, which he runs. And here's what he tells them. The belief that we are a great country is deeply ingrained, ingrained in me. But great in what? Territory, population, arms, troubles, lack of rights, life's disorderliness. In what do we, who have virtually the highest infant mortality rate on the planet, take pride? It is not easy answering the questions, who are you and who do you want to be? A country which is feared or a country which is respected? A country of power or a country of kindness? Vitaly Ignatenko, who was a Russian journalist who covered Gorbachev's rise to power and then the fall of the Berlin Wall, he looked at things and said, look, it was just untenable to try to have a union, a Soviet union, based on an undemocratic ideology. It just wasn't going to last long term. And here you have Oleg Grinevsky, who's a Soviet career diplomat, who's going, look, communist ideology is associated above all with the Soviet Union. Once you dump the ideology, uh, that's going to be it for the Soviet Union. And then you have Gorbachev's successor, Boris Yeltsin, who said, look, no one wants a new Soviet Union. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be different. OK. So you could make a perfectly good argument, an answer to the original question saying, no, it's not Ronald Reagan. It's the human rights clauses of the Helsinki Accords and Carter's subsequent human rights campaign that destroyed communist belief in communism. When they no longer believe it, the system's done. All right, another president, another counter argument. Some would argue, all that's nonsense. The real story is Richard Nixon, cold warrior incarnate who decided to play the China card. And he's going to end Mao's complete isolation from the non-communist world 
and try to gang up with Mao to overextend the Soviet Union. Others would argue that Mao, when he looked at this little picture, because he has a, a very important border conflict with Russia in those two areas, and it's rather ugly, and he, he's still going to decide to play the America card. And whichever way it is, uh, here's how that goes. Um, got a nice picture for you. During this border crisis, the Soviets approached the United States and asked us whether it would be OK to nuke China. And we said, no, <laughs> that would not be remotely OK to do that. And Mao figured it out. The one that wants to nuke you, that's the primary adversary. <laughs> and so you look at Mao recalculating and thinking, maybe it's time to gang up with the United States. So either way, there's this confluence of interest among between the United States and China that Russia's their primary enemy, and what's going to go on is um, th the hostility with China will force Russia to militarize its long frontier with China. And these aren't just average forces there. They're, they're mechanized, they're nuclear equipped, et cetera. Really expensive. Imagine if this country had to maintain that sort of force on both our long Mexican and Canadian borders. I believe it would be bankrupting, right? And the Soviet economy was and remains a shrinking percentage of ours. So bad news for the Soviets when everyone gets around to, uh, this is a lovely poster, the Chinese trying to get rid of, smash the revisionists with this new plan. So some would argue that US cooperation with China uh, fatally overextended the Soviet Union. And that is truly the reason why the Cold War ended the way it did. Completely different argument. OK, now I'm going to take an additional overarching argument, which is going to look at all US presidents from uh, Nixon to Reagan to say, each one open opportunities for the others. So you start with Nixon, who's going to play a China card. And, this is, and then his successors are going to play it with ever greater dexterity. You're going to have uh, Ford, who's going to bring in the Helsinki human rights things, that Carter is going to play even more aggressively. He begins a military buildup that Reagan then finishes. And there it positions the United States to deal with the Soviet Union from a position of ideological and military strength. So, P.S. For those of you who think that U.S. foreign policy is inconsistent, think again and think at the strategic level. For the entire 20th century, virtually, there was a consensus between the Republican and Democratic parties on the objective to keep free trade, maintain democracy, and contain communism. And it doesn't matter which party you are. You have different strategies for getting there. I got that. But the overarching objective was remarkably consistent and rather relentless. So you could argue that Presidents Nixon through Reagan produced the cumulative presidential effects that finally did in the Soviet Union. OK, if you, don't, if you think the great man history kind of explanations aren't where you want to go, this is another one. You could say, all that great man stuff is nonsense. The real story is about a, military, a particular instrument, platform that it was these nuclear submarines that, that changed everything all around. Why? What happened is the Soviets feared, because of our superiority of our nuclear subforce, that they lacked a credible second strike capacity. So that put them on a, a very high risk first strike nuclear posture that really made them nervous. And here's how they looked at it. So, Valery Boldin, who's this longtime aide of Gorbachev, said, look at the United States. Your most powerful strength is a naval fleet. And given our country's geographic setup and budgetary setup, we aren't about to get one. And here's Marshal Yazov. For the Americans, the main means for atomic attack was the fleet. All right, this man, Marshal Akhromeyev, you notice he dies in 1991. The moment the Soviet Union collapses, he commits suicide. His life's work had imploded before him. But in 1987, he was visiting the United States. And he was being hosted uh, by Jimmy Carter, an Annapolis graduate. 
and also a submariner. And under Jimmy Carter, what had happened is we ha before had a fairly defensive naval strategy. Well, we go on the offense, and we start um, positioning our subs right outside of their ba sub bastions. And here's what his reaction to this is. We know, you know where our submarines are, but we don't know where yours are. And that's destabilizing. You, the United States Navy, are the problem. Go Navy. And here's his host, Admiral Trost, who's summing up the event afterwards. He said, look, the inability of the Soviet Union to maintain a strong defensive capa cap capability led to the demise of the Soviet Union and so that we didn't have to worry about them anymore that the Soviets just simply lacked the ability to counter our naval strategy. Also, under Ronald Reagan, he'd gotten us up to um, six ships short of a 600-ship navy. The Soviets simply couldn't match it. So the Soviet Union could not counter technologically or financially the US submarine threat to its retaliatory nuclear forces. And so ending the Cold War was the only solution to their problems. Right? They're being bankrupted by all of this. Their economy's imploding, and they can't protect themselves. It's bad. OK, all of these preceding explanations have been naval explanations. Naval, spelled with an E, as in staring at one's own. They're all about what the United States did or didn't do. At the Naval War College, we try to encourage students to think beyond their own country. Look at the other side. What are the motivations of others? And even if you can scope that out, what is the interaction going to look like between us and whomever we're at interacting with? And it's a complicated story. And Clausewitz, who is one of the gurus for those in the strategy and war, strategy and po policy course, one of the key theorists, uh, he, he's writing about war as an interaction. That is one of the main themes of his book. So if you're going to interact, you've got to look at the other side. Arnold Toynbee was one of the finest historians of the 20th century. And he has this fun little quotation I like, civilizations die from suicide, not by murder. So I've given you all the murder explanations. What other countries did to the Soviet Union? Now I'm going to turn to the suicide, what the Soviet Union did to itself. And I'm going to start with one. One could argue that um, the collapse of the Soviet empire uh, was the cause, not the result, of their loss in the Cold War. Think about the domino theory. Remember, it was all supposed to be how, in theory, if the United States didn't take enough proactive uh, strategies all over the world, that countries would sequentially fall to communism, right? Well, what actually happened? Think about it. The domino th theory applied to the Soviet empire. Those dominoes just all went incredibly rapidly from 88, 89, 90, 91. So if you look at the Warsaw Pact countries, when demonstrations started for democracy in one country, the contagion spread to all of the others. And they'd had unrest in the past. But the way to stop it had been to send in tanks and kill lots of people. And you will notice that this is what China does at a, about exactly the same time. At Tiananmen Square, demonstrators, what does China do? Sends in tanks. Guess what that does to civilians? The end. That's not what's going on in Eastern Europe. You could still do that, but the leaders for whatever reasons, didn't have the stomach for the kind of violence it would entail. Or maybe they didn't see what the consequences were going to be. So Gorbachev's call, calls for glasness, which is openness or liberalization, and perestroika, which were his big two buzzwords, that one's uh, economic reform or rebuilding, resonated across Eastern Europe and Russia. There are all kinds of demonstrations in Russia for greater freedoms. And then more demonstrations in Eastern Europe for freedom from Russia. And the problem, uh, Gorbachev didn't, he encouraged actually the demonstrations. And he encouraged Eastern European governments to reform as he was do doing. And he believed that they, the Soviet Union had subsidized them forever. They needed to reform and get their economies on their own feet. So, all sorts of exciting things are happening, and the reforms start in Poland. 
Poland had been the site of numerous occasions when workers rose up. They rose up in 1956, 1970, 1976, and 1980, 81. And in the last period, this is when the labor organization Solidarity, Solidarność, became nationally and internationally famous. Poland is the only Eastern Bloc country at that time that had an independent organized opposition. And Poland's economy was a mess. Between 1980 and 87, per capita standards of living had fallen by 3.2%. So that when in 1988, at the beginning of the year, when the government announced it was going to hike all kinds of prices because the, the budget deficit was gaping, the workers hit the streets. And the government didn't know what to do because they were afraid the economy was going to go into free fall. So they went to the illegal labor organization, Solidarity, and said, OK, you get a seat at the bargaining table, but you've got to stop, got to call for demonstrations because they're worried about uh, an already crippled economy being wrecked. So Solidarity went along with that. So there's something called, well, before I forgot a step, a complicating factor here for the communists. They're kneeling not with just solidarity and um, trying to put things back together, but the Roman Catholic Church is an institution in Poland of enormous uh, legitimacy, far more so than the Communist Party or anybody else, and also had a partiality for solidarity. So. The government opens what become known as the round table talks. This is where they're meeting with solidarity representatives. And here you can see one of the so Soviet um, observers telling some of the polls, said, look, we want you to make quick solutions. You're a little country. When you make mistakes, they're going to be itty bitty mistakes. You have to go first, because we'll learn from you. Go be a good guinea pig. Because see, if the Soviet Union makes mistakes, they're going to be really big mistakes on a global scale with serious consequences got that one right. <laughs> what the Communist Party thought is that it had arranged the electoral rules such that it would not jeopardize their control. Guess again. Solidarity won every single legislative seat, seat except for one for which it could compete. And then all the party designated seats Solidarity organized everyone, often through congregations at church, to make sure that the party preferred candidates didn't make it. So only three party preferred candidates make it on the ballot. Uh, who wins that, that ballot? Ah, the overwhelming win winner, winner on the party preferred ballots was the box called None of the Above. OK, the Communist Party lost its legitimacy overnight and Poland was on the road to democracy. There was no way of arguing after that election that they had any legitimate. If none of the above on every single communist isn't going to cut it, you got a problem. Four months later, in eastern Germany, massive demonstrations erupt. And typically in eastern Germany, they were some of the most hardcore of the communists, had, would have done the Tiananmen solution and sent tanks. But the guy in question uh, had been fired recently. So what you have is 70,000 people demonstrating in Leipzig. You have, in, at the point of the 40th anniversary of Eastern uh, Europe, uh, Eastern Germany, its founding, it's more or less late October, early November. You have 1.4 million Germans in demonstrations in 210 cities, and it is doing nothing but getting worse. This guy, Eric Honecker, was out of the job about two weeks prior. He's the guy who had uh, helped trash the East German economy and helped get into the mess. So he was out of a job. But then look what happens. So he's out on the 17th of October. November 7th, this is right after all of these big demonstrations, the Council of Ministers resigns. Next day, the Politburo resigns. Oh, and PS in a communist government, that is a communist government. So then whoever is left starts issuing new travel rules on the next day. Except they don't explain who's going to enforce them, when they go into effect, who knows. Uh, enter fog, friction, and chance. This gentleman, Gunter Schabowski, was an important communist leader. He was still in the government, one of the few guys there. Uh, he's going into a news uh, a press conference 
And rather than saying, I don't know, to a question he was asked, uh, he said, ah, the travel regulations. When do they go into effect? Ah, immediately. Oh, great. So then what happens is East Germans start massing in Berlin, because that's the easy place to go, East-West Germany, because Berlin's a divided city. They start massing at the six gates. And the border guards there at one of the gates decide that discretion uh, is the better part of valor, and they open the gates, and people pour into West Berlin. Within one week, over half of East Germany's population had visited uh, West Germany. And within the month of November, one over, it's not quite 1% of the population emigrates to the West, just picks up their bags and they're gone. It's like 130,000 people. After this was all over, good old Gunter here said, oh, we hadn't a clue that opening the wall was the beginning of the end of the, my country. Really? So this is what you're going to tell everybody. Oh, I had not a clue, and a little slip up at a news conference, and the country goes down. OK. Moving right along here. The Russian, many Russians were shocked at how rapidly things fell apart. And here you have Yuri Ruzhov, a well-educated man, um, belonged to the new Russian parliament. He said, all of our former satellites, of, by compulsion, man with a sense of humor, cast off from us as fast and as far as possible. Yes, they did. And Anatoly Kovalyov, who was long time, you can see here, deputy foreign minister, he said, look, uh, the Soviet Union had no confidence whatsoever that when the East German army starts to shoot, it's going to shoot the demonstrators or is it going to shoot the Soviet Red Army? And the same uh, generalization applies to Poland and Hungary. OK. With friends like these, you don't even need enemies, right? They, your friends have covered that one. So some could argue that unrest in the empire is what did in the Soviet Union, that killed it all off. But there's another way of looking at it, saying, look, you wouldn't have had all that unrest, et cetera, if the satellites had been healthy, that there's a, an underlying, more important explanation. If you look at the globe here circa 1960, which is when this is, see all the green areas? Those are all the countries that are about to be decolonized. They're countries that are so sick, as a rule, of their Western colonizers. So when the Soviet Union comes in and says, ah, oh, we have a permanent solution for the West, there are many takers in that group. So fast forward to circa 1980, and you'll notice there are all these red places on the map, et cetera. So the Soviet Union's been on a roll. You say, ah, oh, that looks good. Well, here's the problem. Many of these places that joined became uh, pals with the Soviet Union are very dependent on resource exports. And resource prices tank. There's a big recession as a result of oil price hikes, et cetera, that creates recessions. And then it has the aftershock by the time you get to 79 through 83, where uh, commodity prices are tanking. And so this means that new friend, newfound pals such as uh, Ethiopia is one of them, South Yemen, Nicaragua, Angola uh, are, are, are just suffering. And these name, place names should be familiar to you, right? They're still a mess from their dalliance from communism. It's, it's been a long, hard road. And the Soviet Union's problem was by the time you get into the 80s, oil prices are tanking, and that's what it funds everything for them. So they can't really afford all the non-performing pals. Gets better. Soviet Union has all sorts of nationalities within the Soviet Union. And they all started revolting simultaneously. And one of the rules for continental empire is no two front wars. Well, Russia at this point has so many fronts, no one can keep count that, uh, in fact, if you look at where all the, the things were going on, there were warning signs in 84, 85 in Kazakhstan and Yakutia. It begins by the time you get to 1990. You've got about 76 hot spots in this far-flung country of nationalities and open revolt. So you could argue, make a perfectly persuasive answer to why the Soviet Union lose the Cold War because it bankrupted itself in the third world while ignoring its own internal third world. And that these simultaneous revolts, there's no army in the world that can be in that many theaters all at once. So that was that. OK, another counterargument. 
you can argue, it's not these people, it's not the economy. Uh, well, it is the economy, actually. It's not um, military things, but it's really this non-performing communist economy that does the Soviet Union in. I kid you not, this is Siberian road system. This is not an unusual picture. It's a usual one. If you look at Soviet growth rates, they're really good after World War II when they're rebuilding. But then bad things start happening. So that by the time you get to the 80s, really bad things are happening. And here's how that goes. You can just look at it uh, tanking there. And here's what's going on. Communist system. All the different subunits in whatever the enterprise is that you're working at are lying to everybody else. Why? To make sure they get enough resources to produce whatever they're producing. Here's the problem with that. That means neither they nor the government has any good economic data. Everyone's been lying to each other. So no one knows what's the real value of labor, what's the real value of, of capital, what is our actual productivity rate. Uh, it's a total, uh, a total mess. So by the time they start realizing there are problems afoot, because there have been these gross misallocations of capital and labor, because no one knows what their value is, they're in a deep crisis. Total mess is on their hands. So if you look here, you got the Eastern Bloc and Russia there. So Russia from 85, which is the year Gorbachev comes in, goes over a cliff, and then it tanks in 1998-ish. Long, hard, uh, shrinking share of world GDP. And when Gorbachev's in there, it, all these figures are awful. Debt, deficits of all kinds are up, up, and away. Growth has gone double digit negative. It is a total mess. And here you have Marshall Yazov who said, look, we simply lack the power to oppose all of these really wealthy uh, Western nations. So we had no alternative but to call off the, the Cold War. And indeed, uh, Anatoly Adamishin, who's a foreign service officer, said, look, it began when we left this kind of isolation. And we literally exhausted ourselves from this huge arms race, militarism, and oh, PS, everyone hated us. So that you have to be prepared to fight everybody and their mother. And here you have Gorbachev talking to the Central Committee in 86. He said, look, we're encircled not by invincible armies, by, by superior economies. And he repeatedly said, living this way is it's just, it's impossible. We've got to do something about it. So some could argue that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. This man, Alexis de Tocqueville, has written many wonderful books. But one of them is about France just before the French Revolution, trying to explain what happened to the monarchy in France. And a very famous quotation here is, the most dangerous moment for a bad government is when it begins to reform. And of course, that's what Gorbachev is doing. And if you look at people who are alive at the time living in Russia when Gorbachev is making all these very important decisions, they all agree. Whether they disagree with each other on other things, they all agree that Gorbachev played an absolutely pivotal role. There is a consensus on Russia on that one. And it turns out Gorbachev based his decision making on certain false assumptions. And one of them was the irreversible direction of history, always forward to communism, never you turn back to capitalism. And here you have a smart guy, the KGB head of foreign intelligence, who said, look, the thought never occurs to the government that it's possible to withdraw from socialism, which is precisely what Eastern Europe did. Uh, also, Gorbachev made false assumptions about his neighbors. He assumed that the clock had started when he took office and started making reforms. For the Eastern Europeans, the clock had started a long time ago when Stalin had moved in and shot up a lot of people and installed governments, that it was a different ball game from their point of view. And here you have Anatoly Chernyayev, who is an important advisor to Gorbachev, saying, uh, Gorbachev thought that bringing freedom to Eastern Europe satellites would lead them to adopt socialism with a human face. He made an enormous mistake because these countries brutally turned their backs on us. Oh, if this is brutal, what was Stalin? <laughs> right? And then he continued, he said, look, the politics in connection with our former friends were totally unexpected to us. Really? 
You move in, you occupy their country, you shoot their leadership, you impose governments, you siphon off their resources for years, and you're surprised they don't like you. <laughs> this is a draw, jaw dropping level of lack of self-awareness. Think about our country, United States. United States runs around all over the world intervening in other people's civil wars, left, right, front, and center. And then it dumps billions of dollars into their economies. And then it even leaves. And people don't like us. Why do the Russians think they're so special? <laughs> OK, another bad assumption. Gorbachev assumed that if there was no Warsaw Pact, that's all his alliance system with Eastern Europe, that surely NATO would disappear off the planet as well. And with there were no Comic-Con. Comic-Con is the, uh, the trading group of all the Eastern European countries. If that went, that surely the European community, European Union is a new name, European community is the old name, that that would disappear too. And he's just, he tells the Politburo, the Americans will definitely dissolve NATO because there's going to be no Warsaw Pact. Well, he doesn't get it. The longevity of organizations that are voluntary versus involuntary is different, right? They die for different reasons. Last false assumption that Gorbachev made, he assumed that the United States would take a continental powers view, which is a very dim view of other strong powers, that the United States would not want a strong Germany, because that's a dangerous thing to have around. And it would take this somehow trying to keep it weak, and he didn't get it, that George H.W. Bush, who was president then, and Ch Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who was running West Germany, were coordinating to make a unified Germany, fully armed, fully in NATO. So Gorbachev ne never occurred to him that that would be the goal. OK, many of his closest advisors, when they look back and thought, well, what happened? They blamed his foreign policy mistakes, which he said they believed were a function of his domestic policy errors that caused the whole edifice to implode. And here you have Vladimir Lukin, who's this expert on the United States, making a rather wry comment. Well, Gorbachev with no Deng Xiaoping, right? The, man, the mastermind of China's very successful reform, economic reforms. And Georgi Arbatov, um, he just missed no words. The stupidity of the leaders, i.e. Gorbachev. That's what did, all, did us in. OK, so you could argue the answer of why the Cold War turned out the way it did is it's suicide by mistake. The big bozo was playing, playing with plastic bags, stuck one on his head, and that was that. <laughs> OK, so more of Vladimir Lukin. He said, look, in the, you have people in the West, you love Gorbachev, because everything happened so easy for you. Just easy, simple, like that. Well, it wasn't easy and simple for us. Extraordinarily painful. Yeah, it was painful for Russians. But you know, Stalin was even more painful. And the time to reassess was long overdue. So it wasn't that more the problem. They dug themselves in. Uh, I have another counter argument for you for those who need more, even for those who don't need more. Uh, <laughs> So I've given you all sorts of potential sins of commission, uh, what all suboptimal things that Gorbachev did. Another way of looking at it is goes, no, it's not about these sins of commission, it's a big sin of omission, right? Deng Xiaoping had sent tanks in, solved problem. And many officers, after uh, everything was over, believed it had been a terrible mistake not to send tanks right on in. And the problem why, why, it didn't, why it didn't happen in the 88, 89 through 91 time frame it has to do with the field of military prestige was at a low in Russia. Afghanistan had gone horribly. And there is not a tradition in Russia recently, or in the 20th century, of military officers running coups on the Communist Party. That is just not what's going on there. So it doesn't happen. All right, so I have an acronym from you for you, since many people in the room with military careers love acronyms, so here's a civilian's attempt to help you out. Um, some would argue that timely tank deployments, TDD, would have changed the outcome of the Cold War. Okay, another way of looking at it. Or someone else could argue, yeah, it's about leadership, but it's not about Gorbachev, and it's not about the military, it's about this guy. Uh, this is Gorbachev's successor, who just killed everything. What did he do? He amended the Soviet Constitution in 1990 
and took away the leading role of the Communist Party. That's no longer guaranteed. And then he sealed the deal in 1991 with the Bielorussia Accords. What are those? Russia, uh, Bielorussia, and uh, Ukraine signed them, and it dissolved the Soviet Union. So not only is the Communist Party no longer getting its guaranteed special place, but now all the nationalities can slip the leash and, and get independence, and that's what killed things off. So some would argue, hey, it wasn't suicide by mistake. It was suicide very much on purpose. OK, so I'm now going to turn to some overarching counterarguments that take in many of the ones that I've already discussed and comes up with something bigger. One of them is any of the above. You can take any of the above uh, counterarguments I've given you, and there's so many of them that it was inevitable that Russia would lose the Cold War. And another one takes just the opposite approach. It said, no, 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 it took every single one of these factors, so the West barely won. So let's try uh, any of the above. Don't you love the, the this is the state of agriculture, <laughs> this contemporary picture, uh, a, a contemporary to the period I'm talking about. Uh, some would argue is you just look at the sheer number of suboptimal things going on, both what's happening to Russia and what the Russians are doing in the cells. Any one of them is a sufficient answer to the question why did Russia lose, put them all together, and they were truly doomed. And these are Russians. This is their take on it. So you have a guy who is really is a rocket scientist, Yuri Rishov, who said, look, it's because the system is just plain rotten. It was inevitable. Tiamura Stepanov is a journalist. He said, look, I think from the beginning, the genes of disintegration were contained in the genetics of this governmental political formation. Ah, the communist use of words. Uh, the idea is the Soviet Union was destined to lose. That's one way of looking at it. But there are others who would say, no, that is like 180 degrees wrong. Because it, it took all of these factors. If you take any one of them away, the Cold War ends on something other than Western terms. It ends differently. So here's Kovalyov again. He said, look, thus all factors merged, internal, ideologi ideological, economic, military, in order to arrange for the Cold War's funeral feast. So the West, West bar barely won the Cold War. Different argument. Uh, you could take this argument and go one step further and say it took not only every single one of these factors, but it also took um, an overlap in office of these two gentlemen, Chancellor Helmut Kohl of West Germany and George Bush of the United States, who decided, who did a, a, a brilliant job of war termination. Bush, is, Bush Sr. is probably one of the most uh, qualified persons ever to occupy the Oval Office. This is just the highlights of his career. Starts out as a Navy pilot where you're in for the duration, right? And then he graduates with honor, uh, high honors from Yale. So he's both a very fine military officer, and he's got a good academic record. Uh, by the time he's middle age, he's already become a multimillionaire from the oil company that he founded. He then goes into politics, first House of Representatives. But look where he moves on. He becomes US ambassador to the UN. He's our representative to China. This is when we're normalizing relations with China, very important position, director of CIA. And then he's going to serve as vice president under Reagan for eight years. That's quite a resume. And then you have Helmut Kohl. He is the longest serving chancellor in German history since his illustrious predecessor, Otto von Bismarck. He has very fine education. He has a PhD in political science and history. He, like Bush, starts out in business, but then in the 1960s, he goes into politics at the state level and starts out as a, a representative, and then he moves on to be governor. And then he heads the political party, to which he belongs, Christian Democratic Union, and he is their head for 25 years. And he decides, as soon as he comes into office, that he is going to reunite, reunite Germany one tourist at a time. And this is how that works. East Germans love to travel, but they always weren't always allowed out. West Germans could always come in, and or pretty much as, as things settle down, and visit family and things in East Germany. But the problem with East Germans going the other way is they had a habit of staying. So the East Germans started lightening up and letting a lot more people out while coal was there. And you go, hmm, why? And the answer would be money. 
he paid all kinds of fancy exit fees to let them come on out and travel. And he's going to develop a really brisk uh, trade in tourists. Because here's what had happened to East Germany. Eric Honecker, the would-be tank man who was booted from office just be before the moment to deploy tanks had come, he had uh, helped wreck the uh, East German economy. What had he done? In order to maintain social stability, he had ceased making a lot of investments in East Germany, took out massive foreign loans, especially from West Germany, in order to pay for all sorts of social services and goods. If, by the time you get to 88, 89, if you had suddenly gotten rid of all those subsidies and things, it would have meant a 30% decline in East German standard of living. Bad news. So Helmut Kohl thinks, ooh, this is an opportunity. They need money, I got money. And here are the trades. So you get 1988, this is when East Germany eases travel restrictions. Ah, what goes on with West Germany? Gives them 525 million Deutschmarks for the favor. Then you move into September. Hungary opens its border to Austria. See, East Germans can travel within Eastern Europe. So if they're in Hungary and Hungary lets them out, they're off to Austria and into the West. What does Hungary get? 500 million Deutschmark for letting a bunch of East Germans go. And then you get to the end of November, and Kohl has his 10-point unification program for Germany that he's trying to pedal. And then he gives the Soviet Union, which has all kinds of unrest, $100 million and all sorts of consumer goods. OK. It doesn't stop the demonstrations. They continue. So when you get to be out January 1990, Helmut Kohl and George Bush reassess. And they decide they want to do the fastest reunification possible. Why? Because they think Gorbachev's going to fall from power, and it needs to happen before everything spirals out of control for him economically and politically, that we've got to really step on it if you're going to unify Germany in a way that ends the Cold War on Western terms. And here's the problem. There are a lot of people who don't like that idea. Let's start with Gorbachev. The last thing he wants is Germany in NATO, a unified Germany in NATO. He's currently only got half of Germany in NATO. That's but the last thing he wants is Eastern Germany in there as well. And he's made it really clear that is, that is non-negotiable. Huh. And then you get US State Department experts who are saying, look, you got to go slow. This is just the reality of, of the countries we're dealing with. It's just a putt, putt, putt kind of solution. And then you have this gentleman, Genscher, who is the foreign minister. He's unfireable. Why? Because he belongs to a different political party from Kohl. It's a coalition government. This guy stays. This guy is very skeptical about Germany joining NATO, doesn't like the idea. And then you've got Britain and France, and they hate the idea of a unified Germany. Why? Because it will eclipse their own countries politically and economically in Europe, which is precisely what has happened. They were correct about that. So Cole and Bush worked around all of them, and they had a division of tasks. Cole was going to work. The diplomacy and the finance. He was going to reassure the Soviet Union, and he's going to arrange for a takeover by stealth of Eastern Germany. And the instrument is not going to be a military instrument. That's the only takeovers the Soviets and others in the communist bloc understand. It's going to be a financial takeover. It's going to be through the Deutschmark. And the communists don't understand economics and finance. If they did, they would not have been in the economic mess that they were in. So that's Cole, what Cole's going to do. Bush has got something else on his hands. There are a whole bunch of upcoming meetings that, where the Western leaders are supposed to get together. Bush's job is to delay, 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 to let events in Eastern and Western Germany progress as far as possible before you let France and Britain, our closest allies, in on the action, because they're going to try and slow all this stuff down. And so what they do is run tag team diplomacy against Gorbachev. And it just happened so fast. And his economy is imploding so rapidly that he just can't keep up with it. And here's how that worked. So in February 1990, you got Gorbachev. He's agreeing to German unification. Look at the payoff numbers. They're no longer in millions. They're in billions, right? Kohl's promising $5 billion to Gorbachev. Next thing, 
Gorbachev agrees that states can choose their alliances. That means they can choose whether to belong to NATO or not. And the United States offers nine assurances about how that's all going to work, and also a trade agreement that he desperately wanted. And then there's this very busy month of July. You have the German Economic Union going to effect. This is the one currency takeover by stealth. This is taking money right out of the hands of the East German uh, government, because, because who's minting that money? It wouldn't be East Germany. So then you get the 1990 uh, London Declaration. This is all about easing Eastern European countries into NATO. But the payoff for the Soviet Union is they agree to get together immediately to figure out some rapid economic aid to Gorbachev, who's worried about losing power imminently. So you have a formal agreement that Gorbachev agrees that not only can West Germany remain in NATO, but the fully unified Germany, not half of it, the whole thing is going to be in NATO. And then immediately Germany confirms the Polish border, which is a big ticket item. I'll get to it in a second. And look at the money here. Germany then provides the Soviet Union 15 billion Deutschmarks and a whole bunch of housing for repatriated soldiers. What's the housing all about? So all these Soviet Red Army troops are coming out of Eastern Europe. They're going to go back home. You don't want them running coups. Give them new housing, which is what the Germans do, and they're going to be off buying furniture, and they won't be messing around with politics for a while. It's truly the, it's how it goes. So you have unification of Germany. It's signed in September of 1990. Uh, except there's a little event that happened. Uh, I'll get to the little event. I, remember, I promised to tell you about Poland. Poland uh, moves. So under Stalin, he moved Poland way to the west, taking away what had been a third of Germany's pre-war territory. And this was a big sticking point for the Germans to agree to this, because during the war, about 12 million Germans had been uprooted and booted out of this area and other areas of Eastern Europe, and 2 million of them had died. As, as it was all going on. But Germany agrees we're not arguing with, about Polish borders. But this is where I was going to get to. A month and a half before that unification agreement is signed, this is when Saddam launches to move into Kuwait. And this is a problem. Why? Kuwait, uh, uh, Iraq is a very important, was a very important Soviet client state. I believe it owed the Soviet Union then about 10 or 13 billion dollars. We've established the Soviet Union is broke. It would really like to have some of that money back. And so the Russians have, there's a great deal of diplomacy with us about this war so it doesn't tank war termination in the big war, right? Think about it. Uh, the prize is not Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein is no prize, it's a piece of work. The prize is winning the Cold War, the really big ticket item and focusing on how to do that. And also understand that the Red Army is not going to be out, fully out of East, uh, East Germany and the, the Eastern Bloc places where it doesn't belong until 1994. Until that happens, Cold War termination isn't actually confirmed. So there's some delicate diplomacy going on, a lot of co uh, conversations between us and the Soviets. Um, Gorbachev sends his personal emissary, Evgeny, Evgeny Primakov, multiple times to Baghdad. After the first trip, Primakov gets all Soviet hostages out. After the second trip, he gets all Western hostages out. Third trip, not so lucky. He's there when we start dropping bombs all over the place. He was really nonplussed by that. But imagine if, during the bombing campaign, human shields our human shields had gone down with every target. It is the Russians who make sure that does not happen. OK. It's also interesting that we're coordinating with the Russians to have the Russians coordinate to deal with the Chinese. And the Russians understand we're going to take unilateral, that we are going to do something about Iraq one way or the other. And they would prefer to have it go through the Security Council and not be unilateral, because look, uh, it answered our interest for everything which takes place in the world be sa sanctioned by the Security Council where we have a vote. Well, it's more than a vote. We have a veto. And the Russians talk to the Chinese and say, don't you also want to have everything run through the Security Council where you also have a veto? And the Chinese said, gotcha. And so that's what they do. But there's an understanding here. Back to Kovalyov, the Deputy Foreign Minister, he said, uh, he said, 
We must support the territorial integrity of Iraq. This was our sacred position. We must not permit the division of Iraq. So for those of you who wonder, what's, what's, why did the United States stop after 100 hours of ground combat? This is the reason why. We got to deal with the Soviets, which says, yeah, I'd get them out of Kuwait, but you don't get to go into Iraq. That's the deal. He's out of Iraq and not the rest of it. Bush got it. He understands that if he goes, starts heading up towards Baghdad, that's going to be on, going beyond the culminating point of victory in the Cold War. It is going to jeopardize everything that's going on in Europe. Stupid move, so he doesn't do it. Now, if we had done this, Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of Great Britain, and President Francois Mitterrand of France would have loved it. Why? They really don't want to see Germany unified. They're scared of it and uh, totally unhappy. Now, Francois Mitterrand, uh, he eventually finds solace in being a really central figure in negotiating the European Union that's going to include both Eastern and Western Europe and the Maastricht Treaty that makes it all happen. But Margaret Thatcher was never reconciled. She just she said, look, Germany will be uh, the Japan of Europe, but worse than Japan. I guess she hadn't visited Japan lately. Uh, the Germans will get in peace, what Hitler couldn't get in war. And her plan was to leave Soviet troops in Germany forever. OK. Imagine if that's what we were dealing, what we're dealing with today, when you've got Putin who's doing a number in different places in Europe. Uh, Bush and Cole left a Germany that is large enough to counterbalance this man. And they currently, Germany currently has a very distinguished chancellor who's been working on it, Angela Merkel, who grew up in East Germany and knows all about this guy. So uh, Bush, as a result, understanding what was going on, he promised Cole that I won't beat my chest and dance on the Berlin Wall. The idea is that he was never going to brag about how uh, he, his strategy had, had won the Cold War, uh, or the war termination had been so very, very clever. Why? Because if he had done that, A, it depends when he does it. If he does it immediately, Gorbachev falls from power earlier. And also, the hardliners probably would have come to power sooner. What happens in the event is that the Soviet Union becomes so self-absorbed that they're ignoring Eastern Europe for 20 years. And it takes uh, Putin it's 20 years plus for him to consolidate power to become a problem. And this gives an aperture for all these newly independent countries to integrate with the West politically, militarily, economically, allow the glue to set. But there's a cost for this. So Bush never brags. He doesn't get a second term. Americans hardly get it that this is the guy who uh, did a masterful job of war termination. All right. Anatoly Admishin would say, look, you're all crazy talking about about Bush, it's all about Gorbachev. Look, it's the Soviet Union that put an end to the Cold War. They're the guys who quit. And Edwin Meese, who was a special counsel or special advisor to um, Ronald Reagan, as well as his attorney general, said, yeah, you know, the Cold War began because of the Soviet politics. In a sense, it ended because they changed their politics. And here you can see Gorbachev winning the Nobel Peace Prize for his liberation of Eastern Europe and his own people. OK, I'm going to leave it to you to decide um, which one of these arguments that you find appealing or a combination. But I hope I've convinced you that a good answer to the question of why Russia lost the Cold War is more than this monothematic Ronald Reagan did it. Anyway, thank you very much. You own me. <laughs> if there are any questions. OK. Ah. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks, Alex Carter, US Army senior class. Um, 
You didn't mention anything about the Marshall Plan. I think if we oh. go way back, um, mm. I'm thinking, you know, with the trajectory of the Soviet Union, was there a point much earlier on when we could have slowed it, slowed down the uh, the growth and the expansion of communism? And was was a direct challenge to the Marshall Plan a possibility? Would it have had effect in terms in terms of, for example? the Soviet Union coming up with their own version of a Marshall Plan and, and, wow. and counteracting it with what the Americans did? Well, the Marshall Plan is based on having a free enterprise economy, right? You're funding all these enterprises and people put money around in different places. And my explanation about all these, the problem with communism is when you're dealing with something as large as the Soviet Union and all the subunits are lying to each other, it just is not going to work out well. But to go back to the Marshall Plan, because I was in the Truman Archives, it was loads of fun. We understood, I, my definition of fun is different from yours. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's interesting. If you, what, it's Hungary and Romania that fall first to the Red Army, so that's in 1944. And what is set up is they're basically, I don't remember the word for it, but it's basically military commissioners. So there's one Soviet one, there's one from us, and I think there's one from the British, because I don't think the French figure initially, because they're still under. How, it, however it works, but there are at least three of them. And we already knew in 44, it's bad news, that the Soviets, they promised they were going to do this, that, and the other thing, but they were just taking over everything. And we watched how they took over all of the, the, the how they eliminated all the non-communist parties. They went right into the, the police, the Ministry of the Interior, that gives you the police and the courts, and into the, our agriculture, because then you're going to um, collectivize all the land, right? And then you divvy it out to your friends. and if you control court systems that the military and the agriculture, you've really got people. And they just do it really rapidly. So they're in Eastern Europe and there to stay. And they keep the Red Army there forever, right? Gorbachev pulls the Red Army and then things are gone. And you can see it's very, you, if you want to occupy someone, right? We can stay in Iraq forever, right? We could, it's a very expensive proposition, right? And the, the, one of the things for those of you who are students here, to consider is, so our country has this wonderful position of relative sanctuary. And there are problems the world over. And we can technically, may not be a smart thing to do, intervene everywhere, right? But it's really expensive. So you want to think very cautiously about where is it necessary to do this? Because it's, as we all know, it's easy to get in and it's really hard to get out. So. This is the thing to think about. And the, the Russians, of course, is, it's the opposite case. They're a continental power, and they've been invading people forever. It's terribly expensive, and it hasn't helped their economy. And I, I, I don't think any Marshall Plan would save them, right? Because they fundamentally have to reform how their economy works. And if you compare China, so Gorbachev does political reforms, and then he thinks once you do that, then you do economic reforms. Chinese watch, and, and also, uh, Russia never had the commercial tradition that China has. Russia had always operated like under czarist monopolies and things. But China had a vibrant, for thousands of years, commercial economy. So that they go after the economy first. But now we're in a period where economic reform and political reform in China no longer run parallel, but at cross purposes. So we're in different territory. But I, I, I digress. There's another question here. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Marcus Garcia. Like Alex, I'm a student here, and I, too, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, you've presented a very nuanced and complex interplay of, of possible reasons for the collapse. Uh, does it provide a lens at all for a grand strategy on how to deal with China? I mean, given, oh, your, given oh, yeah. your, uh, your experience and what you just mentioned about oh, yeah. China, that would be my question. Oh, China? Well, first of all, you don't control China's decisions. So I would think don't kid yourself that you do, and they may do horrifically self-defeating things. China's best bet is just to join the party, right? They have benefited so enormously from opening up. But be aware, there's, I think it's about 7.5% of China's population are members of the Communist Party. They want to keep the racket running. It's not about the welfare of all the Chinese. Uh -uh. It's about keeping the Communist Party in power. And economic reform, 
no longer is in the party's political benefit because their reforms have reached a point where you really do need to open up things and allow private businesses to take off and what's going on right now. The princelings, who are they in China? They are the descendants, okay, we're talking about like, we're doing classes in a classless society, ho, ho, ho. So the princelings are descendants of people whose daddy, granddad, probably granddaddies were on the long march. And those are the ones, like Xi Jinping, who control the state-run enterprises. Even if those things don't really make money, that's the trust fund. Those are the things they control. So for a while, they allowed all, what, what made China grow is all the private enterprises, right? Well, now it's reached the point where they got problems, political problems, and they don't like having all this extra money out there that they don't control, and oh, by the way, the economy's not doing so well now, so where are you gonna poach? You're gonna poach on the private side. And now they're closing down on information, and uh, if you're running a private, the internet speeds in China are apparently are just abysmal, because they're going through so many firewalls with uh, the Communist Party checking every last emoji on your email to see if it's you know doing something that would wound the tender sympathies of Xi Jinping. Well, that they're, they're in trouble. They're in trouble because their economy is, is uh, heading over. They're gonna have a recession, right? And because they're in denial, it's gonna be a bigger recession. It's unclear what the timing is. So uh, it's, you don't have to, if you're in the Navy, I know you have wonderful equipment and you like the idea of going right, in, you don't like the access denial stuff, but understand, Understand all those nasty, cluttered seas around China, you don't have to go there. You don't. They do. They do. And their economic, containment's great. Their economic strategies, such as sanctioning the bejesus out of them if it comes to that. And think about it. People say, oh, sanctions don't work. It's because they're, they don't get it. You know how compounded growth works? It's kind of amazing. Well, let's do compounded growth that doesn't happen. Let's say, I cut China's growth rate one or two percent per year, and you got a lot of engineers in here can do the math, and then I run that for 10 or 20 years, and then my growth just goes putt putt. I believe time's on your side if that goes on. And this is very much what our strategy was with the Soviet Union. So I get it, you can do all sorts of evil things to the Chinese. Oh, another thing that you should, this is important information for you if you get at this level. Understand that China's a face society, and you must, it's like you're, in this respect, I'm not trying to be insulting to the Chinese, but it's like with your kids, sometimes when you have someone who hasn't enough sleep, you gotta get an off ramp for them. In China, they are face society. It's gonna be easy to back them up against the wall, and that doesn't make them fun. It can make them lethally dangerous. You're gonna have to think of an off ramp for them, a face saving off ramp that does not involve nuclear weapons being flung around, because that happens, I don't care who gets hit, whatever, the world as we know it will change in a bad way. So another thing to realize, because we're a maritime country, relative sanctuary, you do not have to solve China. You just don't. You just give them a massive timeout. <laughs> so I think I'm at <laughs> I think I'm at time. I will, uh, sure. Any other questions? Yeah, over there. Ah. Someone I recognize. I paid him. <laughs> hey, Dr. Payne, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, do you see any of the, uh, whether they were the external factors, internal factors, the self-defeating mechanisms that plagued the Soviet Union applying to the United States or the West today that we need to be cautious of? Yeah. Um, I look at what's going on now in our country, and it looks like we're doing things that are tremendously self-destructive to ourselves. It was, it, I developed this lecture, I can't remember how many, I guess it was like 2013, 14, because that's when I, I was at the Hoover Archives reading all this stuff. And when I was reading uh, the Carter's human rights speeches, to me, they resonate now, of that we've forgotten who we are. And uh, Carter wasn't a particularly effective president in many ways, uh, but, I'm with him, we're more than just being a bunch of rich people, and we've forgotten that. And there's a whole level of mean in this country. 
and unwilling. Oh, another thing about the arguments and counterarguments that really is important to education is instead of vilifying someone who disagrees with you or dismissing them as an idiot, listen to them. Like all of these arguments, what I did is I just went through all the things that I've read. There are a bunch of them are mutually exclusive. But I thought they were honest. These are different Russians, and this is their take on it. And in a way, it's the totality of it all. It gives you a more total um, experience. But the important thing is, so you, you disagree with each other. Why do we disagree? Well, on many really portentous issues, like why did the Cold War end, the data is incomplete. I mean, uh, it's like an aggregate of Soviet decision making. Where would I ever get the data on that one? I don't know. And then another piece, which is another uh, reason not to vilify others, is we have different priorities. For instance, it was fun. We lived in um, Australia for um, a year. And if you think of liberty and equality being on uh, trade-offs, like if you have a completely um, equal society, everyone's got exactly the same stuff, you're going to have precious little liberty. right? But if you allow total liberty, you're probably going to have a lot of inequality going on. So if you look at this country, if you, a continuum, we're way out towards the liberty end of the spectrum. If you go to Australia, a wonderful country, they're much more towards equality. And what they taught, a real emphasis in Australia is on the fair go. You want to give all of your neighbors a fair go. And so who's right, who's wrong? You know, this is a, a value, a preference. The Australians say, and it's a consensus pretty much there, that they want to spend much more money on social welfare and evening things out, et cetera. And our country has made a different decision. So to me, these, uh, there's a value to your education here of respecting what other people have to say. And uh, well, maybe uh, we will remind ourselves when we stop being so mean to each other. And I think that's it. Pollyanna's done. <laughs>